Hello everybody, uh, this is a short video about the Low Income Taxpayer Clinic uh, and we have Bob Hamilton here with us today. Bob is the managing attorney for the Low Income Taxpayer Clinic uh, and MidPen Legal Services is the entity that, uh, that uh, manages the, the clinic um, and they have 14 offices in 18 different counties. So. Uh, Bob represents um, 18 counties, including Lancaster County. And the Low Income Taxpayer Clinic is a great resource uh, for um, a lot of our VITA volunteers who um, maybe are having uh, some issues with the IRS, um, some legal tax issues um, that are uh, most likely kind of out of our uh, our scope of knowledge. So um, that's why it's so great to, to have the Low Income pa Taxpayer Clinic um, for us to refer some of our VITA clients to, um, to, to get them the help that they need. Um, so we want, we want you to know what the Low Income Taxpayer Clinic is so that you are aware uh, that it's there and that you're aware of the types of cases that you might be able to refer clients uh, with, those, with those circumstances uh, to Bob at the clinic. Um, so sometimes those problems are kind of hard to, to spot, um, but uh, Bob is going to kind of go through and outline what the clinic is and um, what types of cases uh, are appropriate to send over to him. Uh, so without further ado, I'll introduce Bob Hamilton um, and he'll give us an overview. Bob? All right. Thank you, Steve, and hello, everybody. Um, great to be with you all. Um, I'm going to go through just a short PowerPoint presentation here about, as Steve said, the, the clinic and the types of cases we handle. Um, so starting with the, the, the first slide on your screen there, um, an overview of the clinic, and I will go through, um, I'll explain a little bit more about this screen um, later on in the PowerPoint. but. What we do at MidPen, the Low Income Taxpayer Clinic, um, you can see right there, we provide free legal representation for low income taxpayers. And I'll have a chart showing what we consider to be low income taxpayers later um, with federal income tax controversies. And that controversy word is really important for us. That's, that's uh, the baseline um, in determining what kind of cases we can accept. So for, for our management purposes, the controversy is defined as a dispute between an individual and the IRS concerning the determination, collection, or refund of any tax penalties, additions to tax or interest. So that's the, that's the first step there. There's got to be some kind of dispute, disagreement between the taxpayer and the IRS. Um, the, we are 501c3. Um, we are provided a grant through matching funds um, for the development, expansion, or continuation of, um, of our LITC program. We exist in 49 of 50 states in the United States. Um, in 2015, there were 132 similar clinics. Um, there are five that exist in Pennsylvania. Uh, MidPen is the only one that represents the middle portion of the state, so it's a, it's a pretty big geographic area. I don't think that the the other clinics that you see listed there um, have quite the the geographic area that we do. Um, their case numbers might be higher just due to the population sizes in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, but um, we we are we do have a big uh, footprint on the on the map of Pennsylvania. Uh, you can go ahead and switch to the next slide. So as Steve had mentioned, we are we represent clients in 18 counties in central Pennsylvania. Um, there are 14 offices in those counties. And MidPen, for those of you not familiar, does um, a number of different um, represents clients in another and a number of different other aspects, um, including uh, family law, landlord tenant law, consumer law, um, and taxes. Really, within the last two years, we just we just started this clinic. So. Uh, tax is the new um, the new area that they've taken on. Um, our Lancaster County office is on North Christian Street. The address is listed right there with the phone number. Um, I believe it's just behind or near the courthouse. 
Um, and then the, the, the office that I am actually located in is in Carlisle. Um, our intake line is 844-MPLS-TAX. That's the line that our clients would call um, just so that they go through our initial screening process to make sure that they qualify both um, financially and um, if, to determine whether or not they have a tax matter that we can help them with. And then um, the Carlisle office number is listed there as well. You can go ahead and change the slides. <coughs> so again, continuing with the overview here, I have a, a list of things that we do generally and um, also generally what we don't do. So for what we do, it's, it's, a, it's really three things, representation, education, and advocacy. Now, most of what I'm doing um, is on the representation end. So we're helping taxpayers with um, matters affecting them with the IRS, and then both, uh, and I'm sorry, also in um, United States tax courts. So if they get what's called a, a, um, propose, or a notice of deficiency, um, they have a certain time frame in which to reply to the notice of deficiency um, to challenge a, a, an assessment in tax court. Um, and if they don't respond within that time frame, they lose the ability to challenge the assessment in tax court. Um, so those are the two um, forums that we represent them in. Uh, we also, just to, to educate taxpayers, I'll engage in um, or I'll attend community events, seminars, I'll put on lectures, um, trying to hit various uh, potential clients throughout the region, just educating them about their rights as taxpayers and um, certain obligations that they also have under the Internal Revenue Code. And then we also advocate just systemically on issues affecting uh, low-income taxpayers that we see just across the board with, with our clients. Um, what we don't do, um, and what you guys will be doing, are the tax preparation, tax planning advice. Now, tax planning advice, um, you know, I generally don't do that, um, you know, unless I see that somebody is owing year after year and, you know, it's discovered that they're not, um, they haven't, they're not withholding a sufficient amount on their employment. So that kind of advice just to say, hey, you really should consider um, claiming one or zero um, so you're not owing each and every year when you can't pay your taxes. Um, but beyond that, I generally don't do any kind of tax planning advice. Um, tax preparation as well. Um, I, we won't do current year taxes. However, if we are allowed to prepare prior years, if it's done to bring a taxpayer into compliance. So, for example, um, uh, an offer and compromise, and I'll explain what those are. Um, in a little bit here, but if we want to get an offer and compromise, which is essentially a settlement of taxes, um, if we want to get that accepted, a requirement or a prerequisite is that the taxpayer has to have filed all prior year tax returns. So if I discover that they come into the clinic, they owe money, we want to do an offer and compromise, I can go back and, and look at what years they haven't filed for and say they haven't filed 12 and 13 taxes. Um, if it's simple enough for me, um, I can go back and, and um, do those kind of prepare those taxes and file it in conjunction with the offer and compromise, but um, we won't do any current year um, tax prep. Um, we also don't generally do state and local tax matters um, unless they're, that they owe money or there is an existing underlying federal tax controversy as well. Um, but if they're just coming in with a state tax or a local tax bill, but everything's fine federally, we can't accept those cases. And then um, the last thing, of course, are, are business taxes. We're just dealing with individuals here. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, this chart just lists our eligibility guidelines. You can review it um, at, as you see there. Um, and um, you can go ahead and switch to the next slide. Um, in reference to that chart, even though they really have to be within those limits, um, we do accept up to 10% of cases that are outside of those income limitations. Um, and generally, we haven't gone over those, those numbers in the last two years that we've been open. Um, but as part of the initial 
income screening, we always want to check and make sure that their you know, their gross annual household income is less than those amounts based on their family size. And if we discover that it's a little bit over or slightly over, um, we can make a determination as to whether or not um, we want to represent them. Um, and you know, we haven't accepted enough cases over the the income limitations at that point uh, um, either. The other thing is that. And these are tied to our, our, our funding requirements. So the 90% rules, um, one of the, the requirements in order for our um, grant reporting. The other one is that for any taxable year, the amount in controversy can't exceed $50,000. Um, now that's not all years combined, so they may owe you know $200,000 for over a 10-year period. That's fine as long as one, any one particular year doesn't go over 50,000. It's kind of a weird rule, um, and again, we can't accept these cases, uh, but we just have to uh, keep it to a minimum. There's no percentage requirement, but we have to keep it to a minimum, and we have to explain the reasoning as to why we accept it over that amount. But um, we haven't had an issue with that either. Um, okay, you can go to the next slide. So, what types of cases? do we handle, and I'll try to give some examples that would, um, of, of cases that you might see coming into the VITA site um, during tax season that you might be able to refer to us. Um, but the majority of my cases are uh, collection cases. So somebody has an IRS bill that they received, or they know that they have money owed from prior years and the IRS has intercepted their refunds each year that they filed. Um, those, those types of cases if the, you know, where they, they acknowledge that they owe and they just can't pay the tax bill, um, that's, and if I had to put a percentage on it, it's probably about 60% of the cases that I see. Um, so collection is a big, big part of what we do. Um, audits and exams, so if somebody has received um, a notice of examination where um, the IRS wants to review, uh, let's say, for example, they've claimed the earned income tax credit, and the IRS says, we want to see proof of um, supporting documentation showing that, you know, this dependent that you claimed um, lived with you for 6 or 12 months of the year, um, that you provided more than half of their support, um, and that they're related to you. So if somebody is going through an on, and there's a there's usually a 30 day limit um, on a response time um, in which to provide that information. So uh, if somebody does receive that type of letter, we can assist them in gathering the documents needed to um, prove whatever credit or um, um, uh, claim that they have made on their tax return. Um, I, I, I mentioned a little bit tax court litigation. It's not a big part of what I currently do. A lot of cases don't, um, I, I think that the number is something like 95% of cases don't, or will get settled prior to tax court. Um, so I have not actually had to appear in tax court, fortunately. But, um, you know, there is that time limit that they have, the 90-day time frame from when the a notice of deficiency is received. Let's say that they've lost on an audit or an IRS, the IRS disagrees on the items that they've sent in. Um, for an audit, and they won't allow a, a dependency credit. Um, the IRS will issue a proposed uh, notice of determination, giving them 90 days to challenge it in U.S. tax court. And so, if they get that letter and they come and see us, and we determine that they, you know, they should be entitled to receive the credit or deduction, um, we can file a, a tax court petition, and then that'll go to an appeals officer and usually get settled there, but um, it could potentially go all the way to tax court. Um, next item there, audit reconsiderations are where the taxpayer has uh, lost on an audit or exam, or um, they just never responded, failed to respond, but you know they didn't realize it until um, years or months later, and they come and see us, and they say, well, you know, my this is my son, and he's lived with me for you know, ever since he was born, um, I have full custody, and um, I just never, I, I thought I had sent the IRS what they needed. And we go back and look and see that, you know, they had sent maybe information from an incorrect year. 
but they really should have been entitled to, to claim the child for that year in question. We'll help them file an audit reconsideration claim um, so that they can hopefully get whatever portion of a refund that was um, uh, not awarded to them or if they had to pay back anything, um, make sure that they get a refund for um, the <coughs> item that they had to pay for. Um, tax liens and levies, what we'll try to do there is advocate for the removal of either. Um, that's another one, um, particularly with a tax levy, if somebody has, let's say they're just on Social Security um, and there's a 15% levy on their benefits and they, um, you know, they mention that to you, but, you know, it's really affecting them economically um, and, you know, their money is very tight at home. <clears throat> there are different vehicles that we could use to advocate for the removal of the levy um, just so that they're not so cash strapped. Um, so if, if you know, a, a taxpayer comes in and, and mentions that to you, it, it could be something that is up our alley um, to advocate for the removal of. Um, installment agreements, we do help set those up. Um, those are, are fairly common. A lot of people don't realize that they can stretch the installment agreements out over a six-year period. Um, they'll first call the IRS, and the IRS will propose an amount. Um, I don't know if anybody has has experience with that, but I find sometimes taxpayers just are kicked out of an installment agreement because they're paying, you know, $400 a month on a tax bill when really, you know, the minimum requirement that they could pay is, let's say, 50 60 bucks a month. So um, those are things that we can help modify or set up for taxpayers. Um, some of the other issues that we deal with um, on the right-hand side of the screen, um, we're seeing uh, you know, a fair amount of identity theft cases where um, a taxpayer will try to file electronically and um, they'll be permit, uh, prevented from doing so. And we find out somebody has used their Social Security number to you know, report income attributable to someone else. Um, we can help file identity theft affidavits um, with the IRS. <laughs> Um, innocent spouse and injured spouse. So someone comes in with an innocent spouse, it's either um, it's income that is attributable to a former spouse or a separated spouse. So they have to have filed a joint return. Um, but if they're no longer living with that person, either separated or divorced, and this it's either an understatement of tax or an underpayment of tax, there are um, they may qualify for innocent spouse relief based on um, how much knowledge they had of the underpayment or understatement of tax. So, you know, it, a lot of times in these situations they won't know until several years after the fact, um, and they'll get hit with a tax bill that they had no knowledge of, but was should be really collected against the former spouse. Um, so we help in those types of cases. Injured spouse, um, that is where there's an existing, there's another federal debt that is um, that is in delinquency, but the spouse, another, not the spouse that comes into us, but their their partner's um, uh, husband or wife has an underlying. Uh, federal debt that's in delinquency, and when they file the joint return, that if they're getting a refund, the refund is intercepted by that other agency to collect against the, um, the the delinquency. So whatever spouse isn't listed on that other federal debt can file an injured spouse claim, um, and they could potentially get a portion of the refund back um, that that wouldn't affect you know their that doesn't. Um, uh, it would basically be, I, I don't know the calculation of how the, the IRS goes about and does it, but um, they'll get their portion of that refund um, back to them. Um, we do help with amended returns. Um, we can, you know, if it's needed to bring a taxpayer into compliance. Um, we advocate for penalty abatement. Um, that's where um, it someone may have a very large tax bill and interest and penalties tacked on. 
Um, for example, if, there's, if, if they've had a clean compliance record in the previous three years, we can request first-time penalty abatement, and that's kind of like a no questions asked situation where as long as their compliance history is, is fine, where they've paid and filed on time for the previous three years, um, we can request first-time penalty abatement and they can get um, the penalty and, and the um, accompanying interest removed from that particular tax bill. Um, we, we technically help with return preparer fraud. I haven't had any of those cases yet, but um, and, you know we all know it exists. Um, and there are forms that we can use to fill out to file with the IRS to um, report uh, um, bad return preparers. And then finally, issues with the Affordable Care Act. Um, I haven't seen a ton of these. I actually expected to see a lot of them. Um, Given the fact that you know it's such a new area of, of law and it's um, it's something that affects everybody right now, um, and I don't know moving forward how much of it we'll see. Um, that's to be determined. But um, there are certain issues with the Affordable Care Act that that do come up um, that we can assist with. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, so these last two slides here, I'll, I'll talk more about. Um, how to identify potential LITC clients. So the big thing is really if they come in with their tax papers and there's a notice that is um, in their paperwork, a demand for payment or a notice of examination or audit, notice of proposed changes to a tax return, there's an appeal rights letter, um, a notice of federal tax lien, anything that they may bring in showing that there's an existing tax delinquency or bill that they owe, um, that is just an automatic red flag and um, that, that's something that I always try to ask them as well. You know, what, what has the IRS sent you? Um, how, do you how do you know how much, that, or what are they asking for from you? And then it, it's important to, for me to um, get a time frame down because as I said, the 90-day the letter that they could uh, that they have in which to file a, a petition in tax court, that can't be extended. Um, un, the, it, under no circumstances can it be extended for any reason. It's a it's a firm deadline. It's by statute. So if you lose that, um, it's the difference between you know challenging the tax bill without having to pay anything, versus having to pay a portion of the tax bill. Um, after you've missed the deadline, and then having to file a refund claim. And for a lot of these people, if they have large tax bills, um, it's pretty difficult for them to have to prepay first and then challenge um, and file a refund claim. So that 90-day that date is something that I'm always – it's probably the most important deadline for, for me in, in my practice. Um, so it's always something I'm, I'm really um, looking for and paying attention to. So any type of letter that they're getting or they have with them that they're bringing in, um, it's important to pay attention to those and, and see if you know if they do owe money, or the IRS is challenging um, whatever's been set on on their current or prior year return. Um, that those are those are types of cases that we're looking for. Um, you can go to the next slide then. <coughs> um, so, you know, a client may not even have a letter, but they tell you that they owe tax and they can't afford to pay. Um, or maybe they say that they're in an installment agreement or they were in an installment agreement, but they can't, you know, they defaulted or they can't make the payments anymore. You know, it might just be a simple matter of they need the installment agreement modified. Um, another thing that we do a lot of in terms of the collection department is something called an offer in compromise. So, and I, I mentioned this just briefly earlier, but it, what it is, it's, it's a settlement of the tax bill um, based on, there's two tests. Um, one is an asset-driven test. The other is um, a monthly income and expense-driven test. So a lot of our clients really don't have assets besides maybe a car um, or a bank account. Um, maybe there's a retirement account or an IRA, but it, it typically very minimal. Um, and they give you a certain exemption limit within these assets um, that they don't have to report on. But assume, for example, that a client has no assets, and we then switch to the income and expense test, and we see that their monthly expenses exceed their monthly household income. 
So what do you do? Um, the offer and compromise is a great tool, um, particularly for low-income taxpayers in this situation. Um, you know, you have to fill out a form. It's Form 433A and Form 656. Um, but basically, basically, you would list all assets, expenses, and income. And if expenses do truly um, exceed income, technically the taxpayer can make an offer of $1 to satisfy um, whatever tax liability that they have. Now, they have to um, we call it burying their financial soul. They have to provide three months of bank statements. They have to provide utility bills, uh, maybe a rental agreement, um, payment stubs, um, anything else to support you know what what they're claiming on the offer and compromise. But um, if we can get expenses to exceed income, um, technically a, a, they they have to make an offer of um, greater than zero. And so if we can get, I don't typically get it to a dollar, you know, if it's someone who's homeless, for example, um, I'll try to make an offer of like five or ten dollars, but satisfies a tax liability of, you know, could be tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and as long as they make the payment, and there's other requirements as well, um, they have to file and pay on time for a period of five years, but as long as, assuming that they do that, the entire tax liability um, is wiped clean. So, um, that's that's a big thing that we try to promote in our program here that we can you know it, it it works similar to a bankruptcy but with a bankruptcy the filing goes on your credit report for a period of seven ten seven to ten years but there's no such there's no similar um, uh, credit hit that goes along with the offer and compromise so it can be um, useful in, you know even in, as an alternative to bankruptcy for some of our clients. Um, uh, continuing on here, um, say the client has just come in, um, or the taxpayer has just come in um, just for um, this particular year, but mentions that they haven't filed for one or more years, or they want to amend or return from another year. Um, we we can do those cases. Um, I don't see a lot of those. You know, it, typically there's a there's a collection issue underlying, or that's the 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 bulk of what the problem is and that we have to either amend or, or file for other years. But, you know, they may mention that to you in, in um, the course of the, the tax preparation. Um, it, maybe they mention that, you know, there's issues, tax issues related to their former spouse, either failure to report all sources of income, underpayment of tax owed. That could trigger um, relief under innocent spouse or injured spouse, which we would be able to handle. Um, and then also, and it's, it's strange because I haven't seen a lot of this in, in my practice thus far, but I imagine it goes on quite a fair amount, um, is just having someone come in with a 1099 when really they should have been classified as an employee and should have been getting W-2s. Um, so, you know, if that would come up and the client, you know, mentions certain things that you would think that classify them as an employee, um, but they get this. They, all they have is a 1099 miscellaneous form. You know, we can we could potentially look into that to determine whether or not the employer should actually be classifying them as an employee. Um, so those, if you want to switch to the last slide here, those are the types of cases we handle. Um, you know, the issues to spot if you want to refer cases to us. Um, I have my contact information up there. Um, that's my office phone, the 717-243-9400. I'm at extension 2512. You can also email me, rhamilton at midpen.org. Um, if you just want to refer a client to the intake line, um, that number, again, is not listed there, but it's 844-MPLS-TAX. <coughs> that's 844-675-7829. And um, I will leave it at that. Thank you all very much for your, your time and attention. Great. Thank you, Bob. Um, and we will have, uh, we will have flyers um, and brochures at all of our VITA sites uh, once we open up on January 23rd with <clears throat> the clinic's information um, and also with that number for, for clients to call. I think um, uh, 
one thing there, Bob, is to make sure that clients are calling the client number and not your right. personal number. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I left the number of the you know my office phone. If if anybody you know uh, listening to this had, would have a question. Uh, okay. And you'd be okay. If call. One of our vital volunteers uh, wanted. Sure. To absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um. It, I think as I as I was listening to you, Bob, a couple of things. Um. I learned a few things that I didn't realize that you all uh, could help with. For instance. Um, we often see Vita clients come in who uh, end up owing a few thousand dollars to the IRS. Um, and so I didn't realize that that's uh, one area where we could refer those clients uh, to the clinic um, and that you might be able to work with them to, whether it's uh, arranging an installment agreement or doing that offer and compromise. But that's, uh, that's one of those areas that we can refer. Right. Correct. Yeah, that, that's probably the biggest, the biggest um, in terms of caseload, those types of cases, just helping somebody with a, a giant tax bill they can't afford. Yeah, good. And, and the, other, the other area um, is around identity theft. Um, so we often, our volunteers often see folks who um, – uh, we realize that there's an identity theft issue um, because we file the return and it's rejected because uh, somebody's already used their social security number to file a tax return. Um, so that's their like first, the, the first time that they're aware that they have an identity theft issue. Or sometimes we see, um, for instance, a single mother who tries to file a return claiming her, her kids and the return is rejected because somebody already claimed um, those those kids as dependents. Um, mm -hmm. So those are those are both uh, issues where we could refer to you. Yes, and um, yeah, the dependency thing. I, I you know that's something I forgot to mention, but we see that as well um, because you know that'll force. The, the client then or the taxpayer will have to paper file um, with the dependents' names and Social Security's numbers on there, and that'll force the audit. And you know, once you know, we handle audits and exams. Um, so yeah, that if you have someone, you know, it, it automatically gets flagged because a, a Social Security number has already been reported. Um, pretty good chance that that's something that we can help out with. Um, just helping that client get through that audit and gather the correct supporting documentation that the IRS needs. Um, so right, so we would want to complete our process and get that return filed, right. but then right. make sure that they have your information so that they could follow up um, when the IRS contacts them for that audit. Correct, yes. Okay. okay. Um, well, good, and... and um, if in doubt, is it is it okay for our volunteers to give the the um, the the mid pen number um, so that the taxpayer can can call and figure out if they have an issue that warrants your assistance? Yeah, and I, I I'll also mention too our that intake line number uh, eight four four MPLS tax. It's it's staffed by um, our intake workers are um, bilingual. They they speak English and Spanish. Um, so, and, and they are trained to identify uh, the types of cases that we can accept here. Um, you know, and even if, if they have a question, if they're not sure, then they go right to me, and so I can make that determination as well. But, um, yeah, that, that intake line, they, they'll, know, um, <laughs> they'll know the answer, and if they don't, they'll know um, to send it on to me for a question. But, <laughs> yes. Good. So I, I think that sometimes there's a uh, uh, maybe hesitancy to refer um, if we're not sure it's exactly something that you can handle, but um, that'll give us reassurance that that the client can at least call and and uh, and check, and that doesn't hurt anyone. So um, right. I would encourage that. For all of you Vita volunteers listening to this, um, first of all, thank you for for listening to this. Um, hope you found it helpful. Um, 
And I would encourage you to be on the lookout for, for circumstances and cases, invite a client who, or whom uh, you could refer to Bob and the Low Income Tax Credit Clinic. Um, hopefully you've, you've uh, learned some things and, and realized what a great resource the clinic can be for our clients and how impactful uh, Bob's work um, can be for, for, for some of our VITA clients. So uh, be on the lookout. The information flyers, brochures will be at VITA sites this year. Um, so feel free to, to, to look for those problems and get that information to the client. Um, and again, thank you for listening and thank you, Bob, for, for being with us today. Great. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it.